So, my name is Ian Humphreys. Good morning. Nice to see you all. Um, many of you uh, will know I've been around doing this for a long, long time. Um, Cherie has had a, her first outing on the stage. Uh, it's her birthday today. How about a round of applause for Cherie? <laughs> Lovely job of battling through that. Thanks, Cherie. And thanks for stepping in. The, the reason that, we, uh, that Cherie stepped in was uh, Matt Dredge, uh, our sales director, unfortunately couldn't join us uh, today because uh, of some family bereavement problems. So, uh, so thanks for Cherie for stepping in for that. Um, so I've been in this industry for a long time. I, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. But I, I, I started this at uh, 19 years old. I worked in a computer room not dissimilar to this. Uh, it was about the size of a half a football field uh, uh, to change a disc was a big, thick thing like that, and you physically had to pick it up with a very heavy thing. Um, and lots of change in that time. Interestingly, when you look back, those companies were still running payroll. They were still doing stock, con uh, stock control and so on. It was just all a lot slower, all a lot more um, process-oriented uh, from a computer perspective. Uh, the user input was a lot slower. There's lots of you know, punch cards and tapes and so on. So, I was fortunate that in 1995, I found uh, NAV. I was very fortunate, actually. I found both Peter Lingham, my business partner for the last 20-odd uh, years, uh, and NAV, two things that really uh, were very lucky for me. Um, and even now, I'm hugely excited about every year the version that Microsoft brings out and what they give us to show you guys. So I'm thoroughly excited about today and the future of our product. And today there'll be a lot of looking backwards and looking forwards, um, uh, it, it, things that happen in the future and things that we've seen in the past. But I want to make a point that it's not all about shiny new stuff. You know, you come to these events, and I know a lot of you, in fact, I think about a third of you are using what we beautifully call classic nav. So uh, the version pre-2009, the, 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 the sort of older-fashioned looking version. Um, and there are lots and lots of things that you can do to take that system that you've got now. Not everybody is in a rush to upgrade. In fact, we say very often to our customers when we're talking to them, you should upgrade if you want to, and if the system is running fine and you don't have any burning desire to upgrade, we're not going to push you at all to do so. Um, you know, software works and it runs your business. Uh, it, there's, it's, you shouldn't feel the, the, uh, the pressure to upgrade if it's doing a good job. All these partners that are here today from... Our enablement stuff, that there's a stand out there that, that will show you running NAV on, a, on classic um, uh, nav. Uh, there's document capture and expense management that you've seen in the videos and lots of reporting and mobile apps. In fact, both these mobile apps run offline. Maybe we should have taken one of those to do the, uh, the conference app today. So all of these things all are all a way of putting lipstick on your pig. So um, if you are attached to that classic nav, and who, wasn't, uh, who wouldn't be? Um, don't feel you, you know, there's, there's lots and lots of things you can do. There's lots of ways you can get huge amounts of value. You've still got the same data behind it. You just need smarter uh, things to put on top of it to, uh, to make, it, make your business more efficient. So what I want to talk uh, again today a little bit more about is this, this theme of, of the change over the years. Um, over the last sort of century and a half, uh, you know, things changed. We had steam and mechanization, which came in which meant that somebody previously had to be a strong person to do a job. Mechanization and steam came in and meant that certain things that needed a strong person didn't need a strong person anymore. They could be done through some kind of automotive, um, uh, some, some automated process. Um, then there was mass production. So prior to that, people were making individual bespoke things, and then they moved into a, a world where everything was mass produced. Cars were on assembly lines. Skills were broken down into small chunks. The same person didn't build the whole car. He just built a small part of the car. And that's all he did. And then we moved into an era where we had automation and electronics, which again gave a whole new frame of things that we could do uh, better and smarter and faster. And once we got computing and network, of course, that acceleration became huge. The number of things that we could do, the amount of processing power, that uh, the calculations that we can do now in comparison with what we could do before mean that normal human beings don't have to sit there with calculators. The numbers are, are, are available hugely, uh, hugely faster, and the input mechanisms are hugely faster. But I want to talk a little bit about where I feel we're sort of moving as, a, as, as an industry and a society. Um, 
and people are turning this the, 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 the fifth industrial revolution. And this revolution, whereas the first industrial revolution was about changing physical things and making them easier to do, something that was physical making it easier to do, this one is about the things that tax us mentally, that we shouldn't need to be taxed mentally because AI and other things will help with that process. So artificial intelligence uh, and so on will help with the things that we otherwise have to think a lot about. People will find new jobs. There will be new jobs existing that don't even exist today in the same way that nobody could imagine in the Industrial Revolution all of the new jobs that would exist in the future. So equally, people will look back and think, did people really do that? Why did people phone somebody up and say, have you got so many XYZs in stock? I mean, if you think about it, even in today's world, that seems an odd thing, the availability of information, and yet we still do this very sort of manual process of speaking to each other about things. Um, we still have people sitting in front of an accounts payable screen saying, I'll do a suggested payment run. And when it comes on the screen, they say, yep, that's because the system has already decided what it should pay, so they then press some buttons to pay it. I was pondering this the other day. Why do people do that process? Excuse any accounts payable people in the room, but from what I've seen in, in the main, on the nav screen, they bring the accounts payable journal in. It's already filtered only the things that are due and already filtered for things that are, that are not on hold, and they use that screen to post the journal. And it occurred to me, it's just one of those throwbacks. When we started nav in 1995, the next thing they did was line checks up in a check printer. And that was the purpose of that screen. Do the journal, whilst it's there, line the checks up, print the checks off. Once the checks are printed, post the journal. Of course, we don't do that anymore. We just do the, the journal and we post and create a BACS file. So a lot of the things in our ERP systems are sort of throwbacks to, to days before when there were certain processes. And those processes will move forward as, as uh, systems change. So I want to talk a little bit First of all, about artificial intelligence being like the electricity of the, uh, of the next, this, 21st century. So in the same way that electricity meant that when previously you had a drill, you could drill through wood, you got some electricity, you could plug it in, make it a power drill, and it could drill through the wood much faster. And again, AI will be that same energy that will enable our systems and, and our businesses and so on to be more faster, or to, to, to do things smarter and so on uh, in the future. Things like stock forecasting, which today are still fairly bogged down into in, in, in application logic, can be much smarter once you throw it at an AI system that can look at masses of data. But I want to broaden the de definition of AI. If you take artificial intelligence, generally what we mean by that is systems that learn based on data. That's really what we mean when we talk about AI. Systems that learn based on data, and they continually get cleverer. But I want to broaden that out for the purpose of today's conversations and thinking, and include automated intelligence, things that our systems can do on an automatic basis, and application intelligence the things that are written into our lo business logic in our systems. And again, I think we still really, really underutilize the smartness that we could do in our applications. AI particularly will give us new opportunities for different user interfaces. You know, today we pretty much type into the system and that's pretty, that's pretty much what we've done for a long time. And AI will give us lots of uh, new things to do in terms of user interfaces and even the ways that we communicate with staff and, and, you, and our customers and our suppliers, the way that we interconnect. If you think about it, even today, it's, it's pretty manual, really. What do we mean by putting AI in all those three ways together? Automated intelligence, application, and automated intelligence. Well, let's look at our, who's got a Google uh, Home or an Amazon uh, Alexa. Anybody in the audience got those things? It's a perfectly good number of nerdy people. As anybody who's got an Alexa knows, basically what you do is ask it for the weather. And actually, you only do that when you've got a friend who's never seen one before. That's, that's pretty much okay. So when you ask an artificially intelligent Google Home or Alexa, what is the weather? The bit that's actually artificial is the voice processing. It's learning about what oh, that thing he said sounds a bit like this. And you might say it in a slightly different way. And that's really the artificial intelligence. Okay? But once it goes into 
the Google Home or the Alexa app, actually the thing that goes and gets the weather isn't artificial intelligence. That's good, honest programming code. Good, honest people like my colleagues in the audience wrote some code to say, he said weather in Bath. If I call this web service in the BBC website, I can get the, the weather in Bath, and then it'll come back and play that back through the thing and say, by the way, can you now turn this text into speech and say it back to the human? Okay? So that's a combination. And of course, that's an automated process. You say something, it does something, it gives you the answer back. Okay? So that's the example of the artificial intelligence, the application intelligence, and the automated intelligence all working together. And if you put that in the context of an ERP system, this can obviously mean that an email comes in from a supplier. And the AI system can read that. It's just a bunch of text. I and mean, that's all we do as humans. We look through the text and we get the gist of what they've said in there. The system can then check. There's enough. Do I want to sell to this customer? Does he owe me any money? Has he got an overdue invoice? Shall I order some more of these products so that I can fulfill that order? And maybe whilst I'm doing the order, I should check using some AI forecasting how much I should order. What's the point in sending an order purchase to the supplier if I'm going to order some more later? So do that automatically. But of course, that's all an automated process. It can easily happen without human intervention. An ASN arrives from the other system that tells you these goods are going to be sent, and therefore our system receives it. And frankly, until the man at the back door has to unload the lorry, really there's no need for humans in part of, as part of that process. Hopefully in the future, RFID, which I've been talking about for about 20 years, one day I really do think that's going to catch on. And as it comes through the door, we can say, yeah, that's the ASN, that's the thing, I know everything that's in that consignment, and tell the guy where to put them in the warehouse. Frankly, we still need a man to do that. But then the system can say, ah, I've got some goods here that I need to ship to the customer. Automatically create the picks. Again, tell the poor old warehouse guy to go and get them. I think we're going to be stuck with him for a little while. And then at some point, there's time to pay the suppliers. Okay? Just at some point, time passes. Every Friday at 3 o'clock, we do a payment run. Why does Bob or Doris sit and go, oh, it's time to do the payment run. I'll do the payment journal. Okay? Why doesn't the system just do that? I mean, it knows who to pay. It knows whether it's okay to pay them. It knows your rules. Even in NAV, we've got the ability to say not just the payment terms for this supplier are, but by the way, for cash flow purposes, we always pay them late. I don't know if you know, you know that, but we've had that functionality now for a long time. There's a, a, a mechanism for saying, I want a different payment terms used for cash flow forecasting. And we could, of course, pay them on that date rather than the, the, the date is due. So do it based on your rules. You're not losing control. The difference in control is you told the system to do this all the time. Don't do it differently depending whether Bob's had a bad day and doesn't like that particular supplier. Obviously, the system can note an overdue invoice. At some point through the passage of time, an invoice becomes overdue. And why couldn't the system just tell the customer, send an email to the customer? That's all the accounts receivable people do. Sorry, for now I've moved on to the accounts receivable people, making some enemies this morning. But they simply communicate with the customer, you haven't paid this invoice. I know I haven't paid this invoice. Could you pay the invoice? Okay, I'll pay the invoice. That's basically the communication goes on. The payment comes in, and the system knows it's been paid. It usually gets paid through a bank's process. It's in the bank account. When the bank file comes in, we know they've paid, and we know what they've paid. And therefore, we can automatically reconcile the bank after we've notified that the, uh, the, 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 the information has come in. Every week, why don't we do a bank rec? Frankly, why don't we do every day? We pull the file down, do the bank rec, reconcile it. It's a, it's a perfectly automatable process. Of course, you've got differences that you might need to send a workflow to somebody to say, by the way, it didn't fully reconcile. But fundamentally, most of that job can be done through an automated process. A nice example of this, we're hoping. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple of customers here. We've got a customer called Peter Drew. Uh, anybody from Peter Drew in the audience? Shout out. I'm sure there's somebody who's been quiet. Peter Drew order staff uniforms, so, so, or they supply staff uniforms. If you're a company that needs staff uniforms, you should definitely use them. You basically get a portal to access the Peter Drew nav system and say, I'm a, a waitress, uh, uh, a waiter. I'm a waiter. As you can see, I'm a size 30-ish. Um, I've got... Um, thank you. Um, uh, I've got a wardrobe of things I'm allowed to order. I've got a, an amount that I can order in a period of time, and they order the goods. When they order the goods, because you work at a particular Haythrop Park, they then, send, they then order from Slickstitch, who are a company that they recommended to us. These guys might want a nav system too. So hopefully we've got Peter Drew and one of their suppliers who want a system. 
So in the slick, si slick stitch system, the order will come in from the Peter Drew portal, auto, so from the user, who's the waiter who's ordered it, in through the NAV system, get sent out of the NAV system to Slick Stitch and say, can you stick a logo on this for Haythrop Park for this person? Their system comes, the order comes into their system. When we went to speak to them originally, we thought what we ought to do when it comes in is give them a screen where they can list all the machines, they've got hundreds of sewing machines in this warehouse. List all the things that where, where they've got um, things that need to be stitched. Um, and somebody could say, oh yeah, I'll put it on machine number four. And actually, the MD of that organization, I'm not sure if he's in the room, also said, why have a human do that? I mean, Peter Drew, if, if I've dedicated machine number 42 to Peter Drew, which I do quite a lot, just let the order come in, let the system check if there's capacity on that machine, and send it to that machine. Tell the picker to take that article to that machine. So the article will go to a machine and actually their machines are quite smart, they've got little iPads on them and they, and they and it automatically knows whether it's got to change the, 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 uh, uh, the, the sewing thread and so on. But once it's done they dispatch the goods to the, to the customer and at the end of the day, at some point, lots of orders have come through, the system can automatically go, oh it's time to do invoicing now. I'll create a lot of invoices, ping them off to all the, uh, all, the, all the customers of which one is Peter Drew. Well, again, why shouldn't that be the slick stitch nav system talking to the Peter Drew nav system? I've got an, an invoice for you. Thank you very much. I'll put it on the supplier ledger. Passage of time, all oh, your invoices due to be paid. I'll pay you. At least, surely, nav systems should talk to nav systems. And why shouldn't other systems talk to each other? Why do we need the humans in the, in the way in that, uh, in that process? Yeah. Now, to show you, I don't know, if we, can we do video now? Yes? So. Technology allowing, uh, well, let's see how things have changed since the Victorian era. This is a, um, uh, a company called the Mag Group. Um, David uh, Elliott uh, is the owner of that and his, his ancestors also owned that company. Back in 1903, before we had NAV, this was the, um, the computer system. And it had the complete catalog of all of the things that uh, that we were selling, which ranged from, well, knives to tape measures, furniture, just about anything you could think of for building an empire. And as you can see, you could uh, update the prices easily at your leisure, because they were written in pencil. And you could change the pictures in the catalog. And like all good IT systems, you could insert new pages to make sure everything stayed in the right order. And it was portable and the battery life is exceptional, it's still actually working to this day. That lovely, how things have changed. I suppose that's, a, that's the point really. We all we have to do the same things. We always had to record infantry, we always had to record how much money we'd spent. We just do it differently and I think that, that uh, plays out that really well. So. Yeah.